I do the little character creator thing, yep. right? So I could just like put people wherever I wanted to. And I would see how many people I could get into the radius of <laughs> how many people I could kill with one <laughs> with one nuke, right? And I'm just like, that was fun for me. It really was fun for me. I was 13. I don't know. I was yeah, young, you that know? Was about that, but about that, that was age. fun. Yeah. And- hey, Mike. Yeah. Why do you play video games? <sighs> well, um,. I've told this story a couple of times in the past. Um, as a child, like a young child, when we had the NES, it was because it was raining outside or something. Oh, yeah. I can't and play football. I couldn't go play football or basketball outside. Football and so it's like, well, you know, I like Ninja Turtles. I have this Ninja Turtles game. Yeah. Let's get frustrated with that for about an hour and then switch to Tecmo Super Bowl or something. Okay. okay. Um, or Mario, because Mario was fun. Um, but I didn't have like a strong necessarily attachment to them, okay. uh, but I did play them. But it wasn't until the N64 and Zelda that I like, like my mind was opened to like what this whole medium could be. Right. right. And I was like, oh, wow, like this is crazy. It, it, it feels like I'm in that world. Right. Then Final Fantasy VII came along and I started getting attached to stories, characters, themes. Um, I I was probably getting pretty close to junior high at that time, so I would have started to be getting into literature classes and things like that where I was seeing, you know, they're teaching you the structure of storytelling and, and, you know, know, literary elements that I'm sort of picking up here and, you know, beginning for the first time, although it was very premature, (laughs) beginning for the first time to see the value that games could bring to those very same sort of artistic principles. Yeah. And so, um, but it, it, it happened to be, I guess, those stories that most strongly began to communicate those to me, even more so than a lot of the literature I grew up, which I was probably too young to really understand. Okay, like, right. I like right. my mother yeah. made us read Shakespeare, made us yeah, read yeah. the Bible, made us read, uh, you know, classical literature, and she would explain the stories. And you you probably know this because you do the same with your kids. You read yeah. it to them, right? So yeah. they're understanding it to whatever degree their child brains can. Yeah. But I think it was like just the right combination of Final Fantasy VII entering, my brain being just developed enough to start seeing like thematic yeah, things in patterns, there and yeah. applying that to myself and going, huh, Maybe, do we do this? Do we uh, abuse the planet like this? Right, right, right. That was the first time I remember ever having a thought like that was Mm. after playing FS7. You know, probably me too, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that having that hit me at that exact right moment kind of made me, endeared me to video games. But um, But what what about like now? As you play games now, how is that different? You know what's funny? What I probably just explained to you is a bit of like a, a retcon happening in my brain. <laughs> oh no! Where I, I I remember it being that. Yeah. But it's very possible that it was probably more because the sword looked really cool. Oh, that's the reason why I played Final Fantasy yeah, VII as well. Right. Yes. Um. I I mean I'm I'm sure there is truth to my memory here but we've all Mm. talked about how memories are not what we think they are (laughs) yeah it's hard um your memories change as you age right yeah Uh, yeah. you you every time you recall a memory you're essentially creating it again yeah and and the elements of it change it's not a file you pull out that's like perfectly documented um so that's what i remember valuing about it but it's possible that while that might have been in there it was so minor underneath the cool sword, <laughs> cool sword, <laughs> and great yeah. music and awesome music. graphics, um, and and all of that that probably was more prevalently why I loved it. Yeah, so that's probably a more accurate answer to your question. <laughs> Man, it's hard to it's hard to even think about. Yeah, like why I played the games back then because I'm so different now. Yeah, than I was back then. Uh, I would play Smash Brothers like all the time, right? And I don't play Smash Brothers anymore. I don't either. There are certain games I just don't play anymore. Mm -mm. Uh, But the games that I played when I played them, you know, I was talking to a coworker of mine probably six years ago, and he was telling me, oh, man, 
I got this really cool game, and I can't remember what game it was, but he said, oh, I just got it to to beat the final boss. And then he looked at me, and he goes, because, you know, that's why you play games. It's just to beat the final <laughs> boss. And I was like, interesting. Huh, no, no, that's not why I play games, yeah. but very interesting. Yeah. But when I was younger, yeah. it was all about the final boss, right? When mm. you're playing Mario, it's like, I got to get Bowser, man. Yeah. And you're like, really, and the surprisingly easy fight um, when you just yeah. go grab the axe, and just, chop down the bridge. It's over. It's over, game <laughs> over. Um, but it was hard for me as a kid because I thought you had to actually fight him. I didn't realize you could right. just, you know, run under him as soon as he jumped once yeah. and then the fight's over. Right. Um, so yeah, I, it was all about fighting bad guys and, and experiencing this, uh, this power fantasy. Yeah. Basically. I think you're right. Feeling as a kid, uh, particularly as a kid, I, I remember being really preoccupied with wanting to be older than I was. Me too. Um, when I was younger, like, that's the I, saddest I, thing about youth. I know all kids, Grow up wishing they were older. Yeah, and I, now that I'm older, it's like, oh, you guys. I you remember. I, I I don't even know if this is technically technically true, because again, it's my memory of something <laughs> that happened so long ago that it might be incorrect. What is the age of the boy in um, Treasure Island? Is he like 11 years oh, old or something? I can't like that? remember, but he's young. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Um, I remember being nine. Okay. Reading that book because my mother made us read classics. Yeah, that's a good book. And saying, I wish I was 11. I want to be 11. Yeah, because 11-year-olds get to go on pirate ships. Yes. (laughs) It seemed like a a much cooler age to be. And then when I was 11, it was like, oh, I wish I was 15 or 16. I could drive and be more independent. Or 13, then I can go watch those movies. Yes, (laughs) right. I, I always I yeah. always wanted to be older than I was until I became an adult and I finally had my independence and could do what I wanted. Yeah. Um, and I wasted a lot of my youth not appreciating it for what it was and for the value that yeah. being that young has and being more carefree. I, I should have been carefree when I had the opportunity to be, is what I'm saying. Yep. So um, yep. I'm not sure why I brought that up. It was in relation to something you said about... With the power fantasy. The power fantasy. That's what kids like I about these I wanted to feel strong. Yeah. I right. think that is unconsciously a big As a thing. young kid, that's yeah. why kids act things out. That's when you're playing. That's what you're doing. Mm. Um, and you're always trying to do that one way or another. And you always look up to the kid who's able to do that the yeah. best, right? Especially if they're also a nice person. Yes. <laughs> then it's like, oh, that guy's got it all, you know? Yeah. Um, the power fantasy when you're younger... You grow up with it. I see it in my kid. I have a four-year-old son, and I look at him. He thinks he's just a beast. He thinks he's so <laughs> strong. And he'll say, Daddy, can you lift up a house? And I'll be like, well, I don't think so. That'd be pretty hard. And he goes, I can do it. That means I'm stronger than you. And I'm thinking, all right, buddy, like, hold up just a little bit. He thinks that he, he's always showing me his muscles, and he's mm. just all about being the fastest, being the strongest. And um, what's funny about that is you grow up wanting to be very strong. And once you or an adult, once you're, you know, 18, 20, once you're finally like at that point where it's like, hey, I'm a formidable force now. Like I really could if I wanted to go cause some problems, right? Then you start, well, you should healthy wise, health wise, a healthy person would then start finding ways to temper that strength, mm. to temper that, yes. the, the, yes. the testosterone, the, the, Very uh, I point. can do it, right? So you grow up building it up, like, all right, give me all the strength, right? I did like Taekwondo when I was 12 and like, mm. it was fun, you know? But once you're finally able to do that, it's like, all right, we're going to switch gears now. You've got this ability now that you've always dreamed of which is like you can fight people now <laughs> and like it won't just be a slap fest, you know? Yeah. Um, but now we're going to do something else. We're going we're gonna to practice tempering that. Yeah. We're going to make sure that you only use it when you need to. Yeah. And we're going to make sure that even though you're capable of it, you would only ever want to do that to help somebody, not to hurt somebody, right? Yeah. And it's like it's a different thing once you get to that age and once you start kind of thinking that way, right? Mm. And you start to have things that maybe you want to protect, you know, whereas instead of being young – Oh, like I remember my son, he tells me the funniest things. He'll, every now and then he'll be like, Daddy, I am going to kill everyone in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, well, hold on, buddy. Hold on. Or he'll, he'll oh, play, my goodness, he'll that's play so with funny. his toys. And he'll be like, this guy's a good guy. He's so powerful. He can kill everyone. And I'm like, hey, buddy, that's actually not a good guy. You know, that's not. And I'm not getting through to him at all. But he thinks that a good guy is being strong enough mm, to just like to kill. beat everyone up. Yeah. And when you play a game or watch a movie, it seems like you're just beating everyone up, right? Yeah. All the time. Everyone. Like mm-hmm. there's really no distinction, right? Yeah. Every now and then you'll find an ally. But in a game, 
99% of the people you encounter are people you kill, right? Yeah. Even in Mario or whatever it is. So he tells me that and it's hilarious. But I'm just thinking, man, you I really don't know. I'm going to I'm trying, right? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to instill in him the values and the the sense of, you know, not not just killing everyone. And I remember I brought that up to him too. I said, "Hey man, I don't know if the, it's a good guy who kills everyone." Yeah. And he goes, "Okay, just the bad guys." I'm like, "All right, we'll take that for now, right?" <laughs> well, and then we'll have discussions as he we'll grows up about that. what constitutes a bad guy, you know. And then, you know, so hopefully that category shrinks in his mind because at the moment, any stranger, he even tells me, he'll be like, "Strangers, strangers are bad guys," yeah. right? And I'm like, well, "Okay, but I don't know." I don't really want to tell him that strangers aren't bad guys at the moment, but as he grows up, then we're going to kind of temper that down a little bit and he's going to learn, especially as he gets stronger, he's going to learn um, that, you know, maybe this isn't the best use of your strength to just like lift up houses and do whatever the things that you fantasized about when you were younger. Yeah. And so as I've transitioned right over the course of 20 years, I guess um, I have slowly started to find, you know, way a, a lot more, meaning in games that offer me something more of a like something a reason to fight instead of just fighting mm. right like something like lord of the rings really gives me that um but even something like kingdom hearts it's all about friendship and stuff and it's really fun you still kill 99 percent of everything you see <laughs> but like it is all about saving people it's all about friendship it's all about forming these bonds and that that kind of stuff is really fun and and the reason why i play games now has a lot. I feel weird when I'm on these power fantasy things. I, I feel like I'm seeing through the developer. I'm seeing through to the intentions of what's going on here, and I'm just like, you know, I this isn't fun for me, right? Just massacring thousands of people. It used to be like we, in Red Alert. I would see how many people. I Red Alert two when you got nukes. I think two or three you got nukes or Starcraft. <laughs> two, you could get whatever. nukes in Yeah, two. yeah. And I'd pack. I'd do the little character creator thing, yep. right? So I could just like put people wherever I wanted to. And I would see how many people I could get into the radius of <laughs> how many people I could kill with one <laughs> with one nuke, right? And I'm just like, that was fun for me. It really was fun for me. I was 13. I don't know. I was yeah, young, you that know. Was about that, but about that, that was age. fun. Yeah. And nowadays I'm like, I don't even want to pretend to do yeah, that it's now. Abhorrent Not now. even close, man. <laughs> like, the thought, the very thought is yeah. just, it, it's just horrible. <laughs> Gosh, and even Call of Duty kind of broke me of that because I'll play, I'd play that game for a while and it's fun. It's fun to play. But geez, and especially like the world at war and whatever it is, it's like, it's like these are, at some point, it's like these are people that you're killing yeah. in a way, representations of people. And it just stops being fun. You know, I used to box. I used to do boxing when I was younger. Mm. And it was fun. I was pretty good at it. But I actually had this dream. I've never told you this before. Mm. I had this dream. I was about 24 or so, and I hadn't boxed in years. You know, mm. I was totally out of it. It was just a thing to do while I was in high school. Um, and I had a dream that you and I decided to spar and just to, <laughs> to have it out, you know? Yeah. And it was like, you were doing pretty good. I was getting in some hits, you know? But And this never happens. I always lose. My punches always go slow in my dreams. Like, yeah. I can never actually fight very right. well in my dreams. It's like this, I guess it's an insecurity I have. Well, uh, I think everybody has that. They try to perform so. anything. They're also, trying to run away from someone. They're or you can't, you don't have a voice. They're trying to speak or yeah. you're, you're trying to eat and your teeth fall out. <laughs> yes, no, I've never had that, but I've heard yeah, people do have exactly. that. Exactly. Um, or you, you forgot all your clothes. Yeah, right. Well, I was boxing you, and I, I won. Mm. But I hit you so hard so many times, and you weren't giving up. And so, like, your face was, like, so bloody. <laughs> and I had beat you to a pulp. Like, and I was like, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? This was supposed to be fun. And That's it turned funny. out to be just horrific and not fun at all. And yeah. you were like, you were seriously jacked. And I just felt horrible. Like, why did I do that? What's so fun about boxing? And I was, it was almost like my adult self critiquing my younger self of like, yeah. why did you ever do this? Why yeah. was this fun for you? You know, mm -hmm. this isn't fun. Yeah. You know, this is something I would only ever do if I had to do it. Right. It's all, that was just a dream. And I had it years and years ago, but it's the kind of thing where that's almost, it almost constituted a, tur a turning point for me. Sure. Where I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to be violent just to be violent, just to have power. Yeah. You know, I'd much rather collect things to care about, to fight for, than to just fight just for fun. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of points you made there that <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's, it's crazy how often this happens in our podcasts. It's like your brain's wavelength and mine are like crossing the same paths 
And yeah. it's just like, how how did you have that thought at the same time I was having that <laughs> thought this weekend? Because oh, wow, I, really? I just watched uh, Princess Mononoke. Ah, yeah. Um, That's we, a pretty bloody, we did, bloody film. Uh, so I watched it on Saturday or something. It's probably been 10-ish years since I've seen it. It's yeah. been a little while, so I'd forgotten yeah. some details. Um, probably but we, last year, I think, or maybe, maybe the year before, anyway, semi-recently, we did a podcast episode on Nausicaa, yeah. which was another Ghibli film. Um, and uh, that that one was his original story, right? Yeah. And I watched that, and I was like, I I feel that this is his best story, his best film. That's I think I agree. Um, and and I it's was so good. It, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and in it's particular, got a good message too. Yeah, in particular along those lines. Yeah. I felt it was possibly the best representation I've seen of a strong feminine character. Sure. Right now, yeah, when yeah. I say that. I'm using the word feminine very purposefully. I'm yeah. not saying strong woman. I'm right. saying strong feminine character. Yeah. It happens to be a woman who embraces the feminine yes. side. Right. Yeah. But a lot of it's times in Hollywood, the attempt to make a, a feminine character or a woman strong is just to make her Masculine. as good or as uh, strong in some of the masculine traits yeah. as the men in the film or better than them or something like right. that. Right, yeah, yeah. That and a lot. Um, I I understand like why like maybe the first instinct is to go there, but I think it's actually stronger and more impactful to me to see a strong feminine character yeah. who embraces the feminine side being stronger than the men in the same movie. Sure, right, like, in a different way, but but, but still outshining completely through the feminine yeah. strength, outshining all of the men who are trying to, you know. Yeah. force and fight and all these yeah. things and, and she she basically like outdoes all of that outshines yep. it and is the true hero of the story yeah. without embracing any of those traits yeah. so that was a strong reason why i loved it upon that viewing then i watch princess mononoke and i see the perfect example of a strong male character oh really who oh, yeah. does not embrace the violence and the killing nice. and all of that stuff it just it struck me so hard huh. and i think in part this is because, and uh, I'm going to say this. I'm going to be strong about this. I'm going to. Okay. Uh, this is an example uh, where on the podcast I'm going to take like a very strong stance on okay. something that will maybe offend some people, um, okay. and I'm okay with it in this circumstance, uh, particularly if it's going to create discussion on this topic and uh, uh, hopefully lead to some understanding. Um, but there is definitely, I think, a problem in our society right now where men feel threatened, like really threatened right. because of yeah. certain movements of equality or whatnot right. that use a voice that sort of denounces certain traits of the masculine yeah. that I really do believe can be very poisonous sure. and, and bad and oppressive in a society. Now, are all of them that way? No. And Hashtag we shouldn't, model. again, we shouldn't reject the entire, you know, throw out the baby with the bathwater kind of, course, of thing. Yeah. So I'm not saying that. Right. But what I am saying is that the reaction to that, because some of that messaging is condescending right. and um, insulting, is to double down in some of those areas. Mm. And so you have this whole, like, alpha male culture, this hyper-masculine uh, a lot of uh, gurus and and motivational type figures oh, coming out you. and and teaching young men to embrace these aspects that they consider to be um, synonymous with strong men. Right. And I could not disagree with that more. Right. It, it's a little bit like, and um, this might be kind of hard to articulate, but when we were playing Xeno Gears. Um, we talked about the anima, right? The, yeah. the different stages of the anima. Yep. Um, and this is about uh, people who identify on the masculine scale, making sure that there's still a part of you that needs to understand the opposite, the internal oh, yeah. opposite, right? The yep. feminine. Because it's a part of you. Yes. Whether you like it or not. Just yes. because you're a man, you were still made by a woman and a man. Yes. You have two parents. Yes. Either way. And you have part of the feminine within you, even yes. if you're a man, and you have part of the masculine if you're, if you're a and woman. And if that, if that inner part yeah. of you is not developed, yeah. it will create a stronger shadow, yes. which will, in turn, 
make it so that you cannot understand yeah. and then mistreat the opposite in real life. Right. So when you come across the feminine in real life, you will abuse it, oppress it, use it, these sorts of things. Whereas when you develop that inner opposite, that anima, as a, a someone who identifies yeah. on the masculine scale, you will be compassionate towards, understand, be able to communicate really well, all these things. Yeah. So I see a similar concept, though this isn't pr maybe within the union construct, where there are certain levels of understanding masculinity as well. Oh, yes, there so are. There is, yeah. In That would be called the animus. The animus, yeah. But... Um, I, I'm saying I men four stages. need to understand this too. Like it, the, 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 I oh, think in, in Jung's okay. concept, yeah, yeah. the masculine needs to understand the anima, which yeah. is their inner opposite. I and think the, he assumed that understanding the masculine was a given. Yes. Right. And, and yet the more technological the world becomes, the, the harder it is to actually understand how yes. to fit into the world. Right. Right. It's not what it used to be. It's not just so obvious what a man needs to do now. Yes. So what I'm, what I'm saying is, is that, there's a lot of young men who yeah. don't have their, a developed anima, right. but are also not a developed animus either. Yeah, they're, they're, that's they are interesting. totally immature in both. Yeah. So the first stage of the anima is called Eve, and this is where you see women yeah. as sexual objects, basically. Right. You're only the only in, in instinct or desire in you is to receive sexual gratification. Right. And that's basically all you really think about when you yeah. think about a woman. And that like Eve, a woman is like an innocent know nothing. Yes. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. You don't you don't consider them on your level of intelligence. You don't right. and as you move up the anima, you 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 gain closer and closer till you get to Sophia, which is the last stage where you understand very well. Yeah. You're very compatible with. You consider them to be on equal terms with you, partners with you. Yeah. That you both need each other equally in right. order to find balance, which is the whole point. Yeah, right. Which is the the yin yang symbol. It's what that's all about is balance between the white and the black. Yeah, right. Um, so what I'm saying is, is that's the anima staging, the animus staging. I think that bottom level, right, of understanding yeah. what it is to be masculine would be something similar to this sort of alpha male uh, ideology right, that is out there right now. Right, the power fantasy thing. Yes, yeah, yeah. the power fantasy yeah. we're talking about. The ch Our child right. brain's understanding of what it means to be strong right. and powerful. Yeah. What I'm telling you is that I think mm. stage four is main character of Princess Mononoke. Oh, nice. That dude is yeah. a beast. Huh. He is a masculine, huh. strong, beastly character who is determined to help these two sides understand each other to not kill if it's the the the, right. the last thing he does kill right quite a few times in the movie right but it's always because he's basically given no other choice right. this woman is about to be killed by this samurai i'm not going to let that happen right or um you're pushing me to a limit to where I can't protect an innocent. I have to do something. Right. But he tries, appeals to these people yeah. over and over and gives them so many chances yep. that Caroline is watching this and getting really frustrated with it. It's like, just, just, like, just kill him. That <laughs> care, yeah. you're, you're being nice to this person. They don't deserve it. Mm. And I, I had to stop for a second. And, and it, it was funny because I didn't like... Well, it's Gandalf's words come into my mind there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Don't be so eager to deal out death and judgment. Yes. Yeah. And we got to the end of the movie because I didn't say anything when she first said that because mm. I understood it. it yeah. I think that's natural to feel that way. Of course. So the character she was talking about is the woman um, from the Iron Town. She like leads them, oh, I right? Remember. And yeah, she yeah. Uh, sort of purchased all these new like gunpowder and rifles. And she had sort of built this mining town mm. and she had taken girls out of brothels and the lepers into her community and given them like a real life and yeah. something to strive for and work for and be independent and not be used and abused by society. So in all these ways, they showed her as being this really incredible leader and a compassionate person towards these others who were downtrodden and thrown out by society. Mm. At the same time, she's belligerent in hunting the forest spirit. Yeah. And, and taking its head, right? Right. And to the point to where everything's falling apart around there, it's obvious that this, and they're still yeah. going through with it. And so Yoshitaka, I think, is the name of that main character. He saves her 
from being like consumed by the body of the forest spirit as it's like destroying everything while its severed head has been taken away. Yeah, I remember that. And she's like, why are you saving this character? She doesn't deserve it. Like I'm getting, mm -hmm. she's getting so frustrated. And then the credits roll and then she goes, you know, this movie really makes me think because this character I really liked and then I didn't and then this, and I was like, yeah, that that's the point though. Yes, See, that's the point. Um, that's the point is people are capable and they show this in two characters very distinctly of very great good and very great evil both. Right. And Yoshitaka's entire mission in that movie, it was told by his uh, wise woman in his village who, after he was cursed, right? Right. Was that you have to go out there and see, like use eyes that see without hate. And then maybe you can find, you know, a, a cure for that curse. Hmm. So for this character, for a way for him to find a cure to that curse, he had to see people. And there were a couple of points where he got really pissed and you could see the, the, his I arm remember. bubbling, yep. right? Cause he's getting angry creepy. at how they're treating nature and the right. forest spirits and things like that. How can you do this? Right. But he has to temper himself, temper that masculine instinct mm -hmm. of violence, right. especially when you see something unjust happening and yet live with those people, come to understand them. Mm -hmm. And the most powerful freaking moment in that whole movie, I'm sorry, I should be saving this for our Princess Mononoke We analysis. should do, yeah. But the most powerful moment in the movie um, is when Princess Mononoke herself, she comes in and uh, I forget her name, her actual name. It's like San or something like that. Yeah. She comes running in to assassinate the, the, the leader of the village, the lady, yeah. and he comes between them both mm. and basically knocks them both out, takes them on the, on the shoulder. Someone come take her from me. And they're all threatening to kill him. For right. They've all got like rifles pointed at him yeah. and stuff. And he just like hands it over. And he's like, I'm walking out. He's super calm. Like, this is what I'm going to do. Right. It's so strong. And he's intimidating everyone around him. But he's not showing in yeah. sort of like the typical sense that we associate with like the masculine uh, power. Right. He's not using that kind of power. Yeah, He's just saying, move aside. I'm going to leave this village. And you're going to let me through. And then they shoot him. And he just keeps walking. He doesn't like turn around. He doesn't take revenge. Right. He just is Even though he could have. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I don't want to like keep going on this point. But Very my point good. is that that movie to me really struck me as being the example of what it really means to be a powerful masculine figure, a powerful yeah. man, not what a lot of our society is pitching as being uh, a strong man. Yeah. And so to your point, I think a lot of us grew up thinking nuking as many yeah. people as possible. <laughs> <laughs> is what it means to be a strong it's a, it's man. A valuable use of time, man. And your son saying, I'm going to kill all these people yeah. is what it means to yes. be a strong man and flexing your muscles. Yep. And that's not it. That's only not. that's only stage one. But but you have to go through <laughs> stage one yes. to get to the others. Because if you never are capable of harm, that's different than choosing not to harm. Yes. It's different to just be too weak to actually yes. Yes. back up what Good you're point. saying, right? Yes. So you have to develop that, right? Yes. But you also have to move past it, yes. right? You cannot stay in stage one. You're going to yes. get yourself in trouble. Everyone's going to hate you. You're going to develop problems. You're probably going to end up in prison, right? Yes. If you don't get past that somehow. But you do still need to have it. You need the grounding. You need the strength. Work out. Get, get, get big muscles, you know? Like f figure out effective ways to end somebody who is harming somebody else like yes. know those things martial arts is very good with that now a lot of people do jujitsu now that's yeah. great and it's good extracurricular activity as well but more important than that know when to do it yes which is almost never literally right? almost everything never. you can to not ever yes do everything it. you can everything in your power but i'll tell you what if you don't have that if you don't have that grounding then you're going to become afraid and you're probably actually going to yes. make the worst decision later on I because you know point. you can't back it up yes. and so you're going to try to do something prematurely to preemptively do something that maybe you shouldn't do that you wouldn't do had you the training and the strength to know that I can deal with whatever happens from this. I'm yes. going to do everything first. Yes. I was struck by two things you said there. First yeah. of all, yes, the first stage is you need to be strong yeah. in order to protect those one. who need protection, first yeah. of all. That is first. Yeah. You need to develop that. Yep. But the problem is, and I would say that this is the cause 
this is why it's so important to me that this is the cause of uh, above 90 percent of crime mm. um, that when I'm talking about like violent crime or like things like that, because it's almost primarily done by young men of age 14 to 20, I think. Is yes. Almost all of crime. Like almost all of crime. it. Like yeah. like a, Very a huge young. majority of it yeah, yeah. is from young men yeah. who are in that stage of thinking that's what it means to be a strong man. And they need a role model that helps them to get past that. Yes. And and there's not, well, there are some. It's just they're not cool. Like, I don't yes. know. You've got to appeal to them, but also help them be better. Yes. And one way to appeal to somebody is by telling them that they're fine just how they are. Yes. And that is appealing to people who don't want to change. Right. And the, the other way is you can be better than this. You yes. need to change. And that's less appealing, but that's the type of role model that kids really do need. And that yes. there are not as many of I think yes anymore and in that first stage of the animus I'm just using that as I don't know if that's actually what Jung's theory is but it's just what I'm using as a frame of reference for this. he did have a four stage in the animus, in the animus as well yeah. but I can't remember what I just don't are. know what it is or what his explanations of them are but yeah. I'm only using that as a frame of reference to get the point across perfect those who are in stage one believe that using your strength to conquer and establish or, or force your will on the world is what it means to be strong, right? Mm, yeah, sure, yeah. When you're at Yoshitaka's level, you're using your strength to stop, yeah, to help compromise, to help bring people together, to help people understand. Yeah, You're not using it to conquer, to force your will, to take them yeah. out so that we can live the way we want. You're using it to help unite people, to stop them from fighting, to end the violence. Yeah to prevent the violence. And that struck me as, as absolutely profound in a time where I'm seeing this rampant uh, sort of like acceptance of this ideology from figures who speak in this first level as That's far as their framing. Least common denominator, right? Yeah. It's like, hey, everyone's at least here, right? And some people do, you can regress backwards through stages, you right. know? Like maybe you did make it all the way up here, but you've slowly regressed back to that point because you're like, well, what's the point? This is one of the troubles with having a large population of men who are single, yeah. basically. It's it's dangerous. Yeah, <laughs> It's dangerous because at some point, somebody's going to tell them, hey, guys, it doesn't have to be this way. And there's millions of young men that are feel disaffected in that way. Um, a lot of empires would ship those guys off to war. If there was an imbalance yep. and a lot of unmarried men causing trouble, it's like, hey, uh, we're going to start a war because we need to get rid of you. And they would never say that, but yeah. that was clearly the um, the result, is it? Like, right. you, other, they're going to destroy something. Either it's going to be our own city or we're going to send them somewhere else. Right. Um, and this has happened all throughout history. There's another really good line here. Uh, Mix said that uh, Nietzsche advocated for a Caesar with the soul of Christ. Yeah, that's so it's a like, great way of putting it. You've got to be capable of being a tyrant, yes. but don't do it, right? Use and, it instead. yeah. To, to unite yeah. or to prevent conflict. And that's, that's harder, but honestly, I mean, I don't know. You'll, get, you'll, you'll end up in a better place if you do that. Everyone around you will end up in a better place yeah. if you do that. Yeah. I'm actually reading a book to my kids. It's called uh, El Cid. It's a mm. Spanish book from 500 years ago. It's a really, really interesting story from the medieval times. But as you talk about a good, positive archetype of like a masculine hero, yeah. El Cid is another one of those. Yeah, it's really good because like people insult him to his face, and he he does do things that he shouldn't do. Like he's in the king's court and he grabs somebody's beard, beard and tugs it down into into a, a drink of wine, basically. Um, and he kind of like shoves his face into a cup of wine because the guy was insulting his mother and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But as soon as the king said, "Hey, that none of that in my court," he had these feelings of like, "Oh, nobody nobody insults my mother," kind of stuff, right? And he he had those feelings, but. He gets up and he walks out of the court on his own. Yeah. And then everyone in the town is like, why is the king kicking? You could lead a rebellion. You could become the new king if you wanted to. And he's like, nope, the king said I should leave and I shouldn't have done that. So I'm going to leave. And he has to say goodbye to his family and he leaves and he goes down to the the Moorish country. And mm -hmm. anyways, I'm not done with the book yet, so I don't know how it ends. But that's the type of masculine hero that's like, when you make a mistake, you you have two choices. You can double down and make it worse and use your <laughs> macho strength to, I'm the I'm so strong, and your ego, let your ego take over. Or you can just kind of take a deep breath and step back and, um, you know, accept 
the whatever comes, but don't escalate things anymore. Yeah. And honestly, anyways, the reason he pulled the guy's beard is actually very understandable. So it's not, yeah. and, but, and that's pretty minor as far right. as offenses go. Right. Sure. <laughs> but he is a strong guy and everyone in the whole country knows it. Like Sid is like the guy. Yeah. You don't mess with him, right? right? And so somebody messed with him and he just did the m- smallest amount to kind of, uh, you know, fix the situation around him. Uh, but that was very good. And I think the way that this relates back to like the kinds of games that I like now, like for example, if I for example if I played Outer Wilds, I was I actually was, about to bring good, this up. Yeah, gosh, man. yeah. <laughs> when I was fourteen, like what would I have thought of that game? Like, exactly. it might, I might have had fun. Exactly. I might have been like, ooh, going around. But like, why is this happening? Why does the spoiler keep happening? Why does this other thing happen all yeah. the time? What is the point? How come? How come I don't get to kill anything? <laughs> <laughs> hey, like, that's what I was gonna say. Yes, <laughs> and I might, I may, I may have enjoyed the idea of the game, but not really gotten much out of it. Yes, and probably never played it again, and never would have said this is one of my favorite games ever of all time. Yes, but the reason that I play games now happens to coincide with the theme of that game. Yes. Right. 100%. And and it takes strength to face, let go and to face things like that. Yeah. Those like to walk into the shadows. Right. Mm. But to know that come what may like, everything's going to be okay. Yeah. And to let go of your attachments. Yes, exactly. That takes a lot of strength. That's That's something that's hard to do. That's also something that a lot of people today, that's a large cause for conflict because they're yeah. attached to certain ideals or whatever. If I lose this, it's in the world, and like I can't have the and yeah. like yeah, people thinking of the very worst thing that could happen to you, yeah. the very worst thing, and thinking how you would feel about that. And the entire concept, and I, I get into, I got into argue arguments with people I'm very close all to and love all the, the time, time <laughs> about you. You must not care if you feel that way. They just can't seem to grasp the concept. That I can love something with mm. all my heart and be unattached to it. It's, it's <laughs> the Stoics would practice that, right? Yes, it, it's a hard thing to do. But for to somebody who's never even thought of that before, it it sounds it does sound hard. Yes, not, not just hard. It sounds stupid. Yeah, well, it like, sounds why? it sounds stupid and it sounds cold <laughs> and it sounds it does uncaring. it sounds cold. Yeah, uh, it, without getting to that point yourself, which is what you're meant to do through the point through the end of Outer Wilds. Yeah, if you haven't experience that there's no really way to articulate which is no. why it sounds so wrong yeah to... and probably why the game didn't sell a billion copies yeah sure <laughs> or why maybe most people played it might not have even understood it yeah i think that's probably true but yeah bringing this back around to your first question right i, I think in a similar way to why i watched princess mononoke yeah. as a kid where <laughs> i love the shot where with a bow and arrow he yes, shoots the guy's arms off i was about to say that i was literally <laughs> that, about to say that I, every time i think of that movie i remember very little i remember the yes. forest spirit and i remember him shooting people's arms off yes. with one arrow yes and that and their was heads sick yeah yes. yeah that whole i would i very literally bloody. as a child i would have said the best thing about that movie is when he's pulling his arrow he's riding that oh horse gosh, and yep. that lady's getting attacked and you just see his arm yeah. like bubble up and the arrow is not shot straight. That's not the power. It mm, goes through the air right. and just like almost like homes on this guy's arms. Yeah. Like like a missile. And just, and just boom. Takes both off. his arms as his sword is yep. raised just come flying off and it gets pinned into the freaking tree. And I was like, that's why this movie is cool. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then the later he shoots I didn't another understand. arrow and the guy's head just flies yeah. off. That's why this so movie is cool. I would have said the same thing. I didn't understand the forest spirit. No. I was like, what is this? This is weird. Why is it like turning like goopy and bad yeah. and but what like what is happening i never understood the end of that movie yes um and i should watch it again because i think i might we understand need it to now. do <laughs> an, uh, we need to do an analysis on it soon i'll put it in a vote for patreon we should but as a child i watched it because that was sick and awesome and he was like super cool yeah now i watch it because he was actually disgraced after the fact that mm-hmm. he did that and he should have he should have found a way instead to stop the violence to right and and he gets more determined to see with i see use i I can't remember the exact wording use his eyes to see without hate or something like that right like that's Mm. what he's that's what it really means to be a strong man and and that's why i love that movie after just watching it now so in a similar way i probably played final fantasy 7 and loved it because that point where sephiroth and cloud face off at the very end and he uses Omni Slash and just yes. like beats the, the, the limit meter just goes up. Yeah. out of him. Yeah, was awesome. That was sweet. 
Yeah. And now I appreciate it because it made me think about the way we treat our planet. Right. It makes me think about the sanctity of life, the yeah. finality of death. Yeah. And how much that finality, that that impermanence makes life beautiful. Mm. So much more beautiful. And the fact that we have to come to terms mm -hmm. with that and accept that death is we're gonna lose people. We're going to eventually lose our own lives. Yeah. But that life becomes more beautiful and more important because of the fact it's impermanent. You don't have eternity. You can't <laughs> you just have keep reloading one life. save files. Yeah. <laughs> you have one life yeah. to do what you can to get to that fourth level of the anima and the animus <laughs> and have true wisdom yeah. and true understanding and pass that on to another generation and right. make sure that their lives are better yeah. rather than worse. Um, and you know, use that life that you're given to be a force, uh, a positive force on on the world, rather than a negative one like Shinra, a, that that is yeah. uh, a perfect example of greed, of, of corporate greed, greed. and of, of sucking up resources yeah. and and giving little nothing back. back. Yeah, yeah. And then it's like, well, you're a vampire if you're doing that. You know? Yeah, like you're not helping sustain anything. Right. And at some point, that's going to come to an end too. And then what are you going to do? Right. So. That is, I think, why I played games as a kid or watched anime as a kid yeah, versus <laughs> why I do it now. And it's why, yeah. just like you said, The Outer Wilds is my favorite game yeah. of all time, so and you don't kill anything. No, not There's a single literally thing. zero violence except for maybe uh, well, nature. Well, depending on how nature, you die. <laughs> nature is, uh, especially outer space, a very dangerous place. Yes, is a so you, place. you die. <laughs> yes. But that's you the can point. Die. That's kind of the point. Yeah. In fact, I just actually thought of that. Mm -hmm. You're basically immortal in oh, that game, sure, sure. in the sense yeah. that it's set up to be. Yeah, yeah. And we've we've been having this debate about <laughs> immortality and mortality and accepting death for so long on this channel. You know and, what? And by You're the right. end of that, you that have to be. accept the opposite. Yeah. Oh, you basically funny. are given immortality by just the nature yes. of what was set up before, yeah. and you it's in and the goal ending is to, that on yeah. purpose. That's, that's, that you that's actually deep. find that's deep. the beauty of life. Yeah. So that that was ridiculously profound. I, mean, yeah. I was just like, I, could, I, I was just sitting there like, holy, holy fish. <laughs> how did they do this? Like, how did they do that? Yeah, how yeah. did these college kids? They pulled it off. Yeah. How did they do this? Yep. How did they just do that to me? Masioka, man. <laughs> so, he, he funded it. It's so crazy. So, yeah, it's wild. Yeah, I, I would say. I'm in the same place, yeah. you know. The, the games, like the meaning of a game, the deeper meaning of a game, you know, what it's saying beyond what you f are doing for most of the game um, means so much more to me now. And I try to convey that to my kids. And like mm -hmm. I mentioned with my son, it's like, well, you know, but it's he'll get so it. much. He'll get yeah. it when he's older. Right. Um, because I'm well, if I'm there, if not, I'm reading him El Cid. So, you know, that's something. <laughs> <laughs> um, but a lot of the stories that I read have that kind of element in them. For the for the kids, but yeah, yeah, they just want to kill stuff right now. Mm -hmm. um, but hopefully that changes, and it's almost like cultures can be like that too. You know, like I don't know. There's the young and feisty culture that's trying to fight for a place in the world or a country or a nation or something, and at some point it's like okay, but you you do have to progress past that at some point. So the games I look for now are just games that are I don't know games that have something deeper to say about philosophy or anthropology or psychology or religion or any of that stuff. Mm. Stuff that I just really only want to think about those things all day now. Yeah. And all, basically have no interest in what I used to play, you know? Yeah. But, and I mean, that's not to say that, you know, I'm not going to super enjoy a game like Unicorn Overlord, which is basically just a wartime <laughs> game yeah, with a plot about reclaiming your there, throne. Right? I mean, I'm sure there is. I'm sure there are archetypes and things that yeah. you could find that, you know, would be meaningful. And when I and, say I have no interest, I'm mostly talking about like Call of Duty and sh things yes, like that. that kind of I, I just have no yeah. interest in ever playing or, Call of Duty Or, or again. even uh, Smash Brothers, right? Or and, Smash and Brothers. It's not, it's not the game I like. It's fun. That I would say for a certain period of time, yeah, like right when the GameCube came out. Yeah, that was the best game in the world. Yeah, oh yeah, a thousand I, hours I, at least. At least a thousand hours <laughs> yeah. in the Smash Brothers Melee, if not more. Yeah. Um. So I love that game, but I have no interest in playing it now. Yeah, me neither. I and will play it if someone makes me. Yeah. If I'm, you're at a party and they, they yeah, got yeah. it on, like whatever, I'll, I'll sit down and play for yeah. a minute. But I and I'm not I'm not I'm not saying that to denigrate anyone else who does. 
I'm just saying that, like, the reason why I personally it get enjoy what I get enjoyment from in terms of the games I play is generally when I can find something in there, a message in there that's going to apply to where I'm at. Right, that'll help better you and your life. In my life yeah. today. Maybe help help you with some of your relationships or yes. help you with a story or ideas that you're trying to convey. Yeah. You know? I, I feel like when we played Xenogears, that helped me a lot with yeah, personal relationships. And and it was all from just understanding that idea of the anima. So I was like, you know what? I don't think I have developed. I don't know if I've ever thought about developing my inner feminine right. you know, aspects Oh, like, I, did I probably wanna, should do that. I did want to bring something up about that, though. The the way that maybe a stage one masculine or maybe an under you you can become anima possessed or anim, sure. animus possessed. Sure. That when we say developing it doesn't mean letting it consume you yes. or or becoming take over yeah. the other. It, yeah. It's like no, just recognizing it's there. Yeah. Like there's this great book I read to my kids a little while ago called "There's No Such Thing as a Dragon," yeah. and in it there's um there's uh this. You know, there's this dragon that shows up in a kid's bedroom one morning, and it's just a tiny little dragon. And the kid's like, oh, hey, mom, there's this dragon here. What's going on? And all the mom says the whole time is there's no such thing as dragons. And he goes, okay. So he kind of ignores it. And the dragon starts to grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger. And pretty, I, I've read that before. Have you read I've, it? It's, I've, a, it's yeah, a famous book. It's great. Yeah. I love that. And at some point, the dragon is like, takes over the entire house. Yeah, it's like his head's walks coming away. out, tail's yeah, coming out yeah. the other. I remember this It's book. a good book. It's a good yeah. one. And um, at some point, the mother finally has to be like, why is this dragon taking over my house? And the son's like, I thought there's no such thing as dragon. You've been telling me there are no dragons. She's like, well, there's one right here. And so he reaches out and he pets the dragon. And just giving the dragon attention shrinks the dragon back, back down, down to like a normal size. Dude, and by the very, profound. It is. It that really is. is. Profound. It's deep. It's deep that is profound. because at the very end, the mother says, oh, I like dragons that are this size. And it's like you were ignoring the problem the whole mm -hmm. time for so long until it consumed your life. You let something dominate you and, and just decide where you lived because the thing takes their house away and yeah. walks away. Uh, and just just because you were ignoring it and, and by ignoring things, it doesn't make them go away. Yeah. It makes it so that they dominate you in ways that you don't expect. Mm -hmm. And then when you finally acknowledge it, then you can build like a little like fence around it and be like, this is where this goes. And I acknowledge it exists and it's part of me and it's okay and it's here and I'm going to um, allow it to inform me and be informed by it and all of that. But I'm not going to let it control me. Yeah. And that's that's what that book is saying. Yeah. Man. That's actually really great. I remember that book from my childhood. It's so fun. And I did not understand what it was about nope, nope. until you just said it. That was another <laughs> great example yeah. of why I loved the little pictures and that dragon is drawing. Dragon. That's so that's cool. Yeah, dragons are sick. <laughs> now I appreciate it for a very different reason. That's a great way of rounding up it is. the conversation, I feel like. We've got a well. six god here. But how about games like Zelda or Mario that are primarily gameplay driven? And that's just kind of what I was trying to say. Oh, fair enough. When when talking about uh, Super um, Unicorn Overlord, it's not like it's okay to have them. It's not like um, I'm saying those things are bad or that yeah. I'm 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 never gonna get any enjoyment just, out of it. Just like we said, stage one isn't bad. Yes, it's just stage one. Yes, yes. And don't let just it dominate understand you. Understand it's yes. Yeah. Perfect way of answering that. <laughs> you, you can still enjoy stage one if yeah. you understand the purpose of stage one. Exactly. Um, and I, you, I feel you may like, not enjoy it as much once yeah. you know the purpose, but but I, I feel like even uh, hyper hyper violent games, yeah, uh, can still be fun if you're taking yeah. them in the right context, right? Seeing it for what it is, and again, we kind of talked about this in another podcast recently. Don't know when it's going up in relation to this, <laughs> but um, you yeah. you can separate. Uh, yeah. the fantasy from the reality. Right. Which kids yeah. have a harder time doing. Yeah. And as they get older, I think that's something that, yeah, once you're able to do that, then you can enjoy things like that. Um, but before that time, I don't know. It, I, I feel it, like I played it something. can be a problem for you. Hyper violent recently. And I was just like smiling and laughing <sighs> at it and Sometimes having a good it's, time. It's funny and it's now. just kind of fun and yeah. funny. But, you know, I think it, because... You, you got to take that, you're taking that in the proper context right. and you're not doing it because you feel like you're living the fantasy of being this powerful person, right. but because, um, I'm trying to think like even, I can't remember what it was, 
Hmm. Maybe maybe I'm maybe I'm misremembering. Maybe it wasn't a game I played, but I was rewatching like Metal Gear Rising or something like oh, that. Oh, something like that. Where you just like freaking <laughs> cut through all the oh, people, like, <laughs> slicing people apart. And it's just like, but it's so ridiculous. It's yeah, it's yeah. so overdone mm. that it's like clearly just trying to be right. absurd <laughs> uh, and and funny. Um, and, and you know, not to be taken seriously, but well, um, and and also, like I'm not. You know, I'm not perfect. You know, maybe, <laughs> maybe I've I've developed my you know masculine side, but you know, every now and then that stage one can still possess me a sure. little bit. And 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 you know, it can be fun as long as I don't you know allow that to stay out for too long. Sure, exactly. What's the list of your favorite games as a 14 year old, and then what's the list? Oh, now? that's that's a good question. Let me think back. Because um, I would probably say that when I was 14. GoldenEye 64 was high, was really high. on the list sure, of my yeah. favorite game of all time. Sure. And then uh, Time Splitters and all of those Yeah, that's shooters, true. You know? I liked Time Splitters yeah. a lot as well. And then as I got older, like Halo and those games were fun. And then Smash Brothers, like we said, a thousand hours on Smash Brothers at least. Yeah. But then we still did play the Final Fantasies, the Zeldas and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas nowadays it would be... Although I would still say I would still say Mario RPG would still be up there for me. Yeah, that that would be a a, a holdover. Yeah, for, through my youth as well as Final Fantasy VII and whatnot. Yeah, and Ocarina of Time. But um, Outer Wilds does not make my fourteen year old list, and it does now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and Xeno sure. Gears, even if I liked it as a kid, I yeah, it would wouldn't... not have been one of my favorite games. Yeah, sure. I'd have been very confused by it. Sure, and it's one of my favorite games now. Sure. Ever. Yeah, I think that um, that list would have been comprised of a lot of Zelda games. Um, I, I very much Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask, uh, Wind Waker, Twilight Princess. I really liked Twilight Princess. I happen to. Yeah, it's um, a good game. So there's a lot of Zelda games I would have put on that. A lot of Final Fantasy games I would have put on that. On that. Prince of Persia I was obsessed mm. with for a while. And I that's particularly right. really liked the second one, although yeah. that's, a, that's a great example the we're talking about, good. though. They, yeah. they used, like, Godsmack for, like, oh, the, yeah, the soundtrack. that's right. And it was very, very bloody and violent. Yeah, that one's and crazy. So the... The first Prince of Persia Same was a rated time, yeah. T game. Yeah. It was much more fantastical, whimsical in yeah. its presentation. And they moved to this really gritty and dark take on that yeah. in the in the thought that that would somehow, an M-rated game like this would sell better. Okay. Um, Did and it? so, uh, I don't know. I, uh, but um, I think Sands of Time I think won Game of the Year. It did, and it was sequel, very successful. So okay. I don't, I don't know why they felt compelled to do this to All that right. property. That's fine. But the point is, I think even most kids at my age there who would have thought M-rated games were cool, yeah. kind of thought that that was silly and going kind of against the spirit yeah. of the first game. So I think they misstepped and they figured that out and they kind of tried to backpedal for the third. However, right. despite the fact that all of those things are true, I still freaking love the yeah, second game. Yeah. It was because, fun, Because <laughs> um, it's, it, it's really, really good combat-wise. Like yeah. the, the, the way that you can string combos together. Yeah. But it is so, so really, really violent. And I like <laughs> <Yeah>. that. <laughs> I thought that was dope, right? Yeah. I, and the combat is, I mean, just from a mechanical perspective, much better than the first game, and it mm. also happens to be much more violent. Yeah. So the combination of both those things, to me, elevated it to, <laughs> yeah. in my experience. So like that would have been probably on funny. there, and now it would be nowhere close. Yeah. Um, Resident Evil Four. That's be, right. I still would put it up there. It's a fun game, but it, but it's certainly not a game I enjoy now nearly yeah. as much as then. Yeah. Um, just because th there's not much to pull from that other yeah. than just. Like, like what I enjoyed about that was more of the social aspect of playing it with you guys. Um, yeah, that was fun. Taking turns and handing yeah. the controller over, and it was kind of like a challenge, and we were trying to do it, you know, yeah. without wasting our ammo on the, on the professional <laughs> so, mode. and suplex, with, the, with the knife every, and suplex. Yeah, every, <laughs> every zombie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, those aspects yeah. of it are what I remember fondly, not, like, the content of the game itself yeah. as much. Uh, which I still think is a very good, very, very good game, but um, not necessarily something I'm going to sit down and go back and replay and analyze yeah. on a podcast or really take <laughs> much not. from today. So that would probably be moved back yeah. a little bit, you know. Um, what else? Uh, I'm trying to remember, because, again, we were really restricted in my house. So we, if I had been allowed right. to play whatever I wanted, 
You would have had more you violent know, games, yeah. I would have had a lot more rated yeah. M violent games, and yeah. I probably would have, I probably would have had more stuff like that. But um, I think the first rated M game game I bought was Prince of Persia: Sands of Time. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I, my yeah. mom, my mom was really funny because she was very strict mm. until I turned eighteen, and then all of a sudden she just let me make choices. It mm. was the weirdest thing. I remember I was in the store, right? Yeah. I was uh, we were at the mall or something. And I, I went into the game store, probably GameStop, and I saw it there on the on the shelf, and I was like, "Oh wow! Like I really want to get this." And like the the nearly naked woman is like very pronounced on really? the back, right? <laughs> and it's rated M. Yeah. And I had I think I had just turned eighteen at this time, if I'm remembering correctly. Maybe my memory's faulty. I'm, maybe I'm getting the years wrong, but I think I had just turned eighteen, and so I I, I came to my mom to ask if I mm. could get it. Which I'm thinking about now just sounds absurd. But yeah, like, that's pretty funny. <laughs> when like, you're, when I, you're transitioning from child to adult, yeah, yeah. there's some kinks to be worked yeah, out. Yeah, I was like, can I, can I buy this game? Yeah. And she took it and she turned it around and looked at that and handed it back to me and said, you can make your own decision and walked away. And I was like <laughs> so confused. <laughs> and I was like, "Sick, I'm buying it." <laughs> Heck yeah! <laughs> oh my gosh! And and the funniest thing is like That's the funny. first thing the prince says in the game, like the, the, the first word he says, because yeah. that lady like slashes his face. He's like, "Bitch!" Oh. Like <laughs> it's just like, "Oh my gosh, dude!" They were tr tryhards so much in this game yeah. to like make it be. I think it was that one time masculine. period too. Yeah, uh, and so I would probably go back through that now and just be like. This is ridiculous. <laughs> I do remember that. <laughs> yeah. But I love like the Dahaka chases. Oh, and, that was cool. Um, the, and that the, represents a shadow kind yeah. of element. Yeah. I, I think there's actually probably yeah. something to that. Exactly. Um, but like just the game design, the level design is all very, very strong. Yeah. And I really love the twist in the story. It's like legitimately oh, very, I very good. I, now, I won't ever... spoil it, but okay, okay. it's actually really good. But you have to get past a lot of that front loaded like yeah. cringy <laughs> try hard like uh <laughs> a freaking edge okay. and then it starts towards like the latter stages to yeah. kind of become something closer to what fits like that sort of pop um fantastical whimsical feel yeah that both the first and third game have more of but anyway all right that's it that's it <laughs> that's it that's the that's the, That's game. the podcast. Thanks for watching, everybody. Um, I think we're done. I think we're finally think so. done with filler episodes. We can finally move on to Planescape Torment. Planescape Torment. This time, I promise it's going to happen. Yeah, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. <laughs> this episode's going up Let's soon. See. Is this the last? Or no, is wait. The... No, never mind. You're right. The one before was last. So, yep, this one is going to be the last one. This is me last this one. Will, let's make this the last one. This, well, it is now. It is Because now. I'm telling you, we're playing Planescape Torment Planescape, next week. Planescape uh, Dev it. History next week. Yep. See you guys then. Peace out.